Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Public Works and Finance Committee meeting of the Moscow City Council. Up here at the table with me is uh, Councillor Laughlin, Councillor Lewis. I'm Gina Terusio. To our far left is our acting city supervisor, giant title, Jen Piffner. Um, thank you all for joining us. This is a regu irregularly large crowd today, and you're all smiling, so it's a little scary. Um, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the Public Works Finance Committee meeting minutes from July 25th, 2022. They look good. No concerns. No concerns. All right. That was quick. Um, our second item is the disbursement report for July 2022. Renee, hello. Filling in for Sarah today. Okay. Um, so total expenditures for the month of July were $3,265,889. The major expenses are those over $20,000 were $3,153,356, or 97% of the total. Um, some of the larger expenses, the HERC gym floor refin refinishing for 38,000, the City Hall Wyscape for 22,048, um, the payment to for the annual audit and financial reporting of $30,000, Two different MIOX units, one for well six and one for well three. Each of those were approximately $49,500. The South US 95 water sewer extension, $145,285. Taylor booster station loop and supply line upgrade, $175,301. Um, 24 laptops and 24 desktops, $85,440. Um, unleaded gas, 6,003 gallons, $27,004. An ARPA grant, a nonprofit recovery grant for $25,000. Um, the second quarter smart transit pledge for $31,837 and the Idaho Pollutant Discharge Elimination System annual fee of $20,026. I have one question. Nice. Um, and, and this may be a bill question or a Tyler question. I see it's not for a large expense, but I see the Aspect Consulting um, capital outlay improvements for the Paradise Creek Flood Hazard Mitigation Study. And so I'm guessing that predates me being on council, but I'm, I'm also guessing like the last time we did a flooding study like I, how old is our current data and are we excited about what this was mm -hmm. tyler yes ma'am uh yeah that was uh some hazard hazard mitigation a grant that we received it was in the wake of the flooding that we had the record flooding in 2019 and yeah. so that allowed us to really take a hard look at, at some of our hardest hit areas of paradise creek and so the goal of that project is to come up with some recommendations for how we can do some flood mitigation and yeah so we're really excited about the outcomes of that project because paradise creek is the most erratic creek in the region it comes up really quick and so anything we can do to try and help mitigate that and with some of the patterns that we've been seeing with our precipitation and what's anticipated to be shifting patterns as we continue to see some climate shifts, um, that's all the more important that we get ahead of that. And so, yeah, we're really looking forward to getting that the results of that and the recommendations. And and I'm also excited because with the updated campus going in for Logos, in addition to the Eddington division, things don't pool quite. And I know I know all the structure, all the civil engineers that will be doing their homework for that, but I'm excited to see it all bundled together and have a cohesive overview. So thank you. I just wasn't wasn't aware of that study. Thanks, Tyler. Okay, are we good to go ahead and approve? Yes. yes. Okay, awesome. The digital signatures, we're good. Okay, thank you, Renee. Our next item is the approval of Moscow Together Project. Chief Fry and Ken Founts. Don't rush the table or anything, guys. We, we can walk slower if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Take a lap around the room. Good plan. Okay, gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm just going to open up the floor to Mr. Fonts and let him explain the whole program. Okay. And so um, I'm assuming you have the a copy of the proposal of the Moscow mm -hmm. together. So that's good. And so uh, 
And also with me today is Joanne Monita and Stephen Daly Larson of the Latah County Human Rights Task Force because they're um, a co-planner on that. So it's a joint effort between the Human Rights Commission, the uh, Latah County Human Rights Task Force, the Interfaith Council, and uh, several business leaders. We have also gotten endorsement from several departments and offices at UI, and we're hoping for a official UI endorsement. Uh, the chamber seems very supportive of it, as well as others uh, as part of this. And so it will continue growing. And the idea behind the project is to advertise and bring together the uh, Moscow as a welcoming, inclusive, uh, safe place to live. We've had reports of various uh, individuals saying that and from different groups saying that they don't feel safe in certain parts of Moscow and that type of thing. And we'd like to alleviate that. And so the goal here is for to start off with for business profits and other organizations in Moscow to make a commitment together. And then they uh, uh, sign on to that commitment statement that you saw in the proposal that they would provide, you know, that they support a welcoming, inclusive, safe community and that they will well, work on that end as once they sign on, they will be given a, a, a decal or a poster to put in their business to show that they're a, a signer of the Moscow together. Uh, we're also having a uh, we got plans for individuals can uh, sign on to support it and show their support. And we've been talking about yard signs, uh, posters they can put in their home window, uh, things like that. Uh, T-shirts as a possibility that people could wear in the future. These are all future things that we're building on. And so the idea is to show that Moscow is together, that we want to be a welcoming, safe community and that we support that. And so that when residents, students coming in, uh, visitors to the city, they can see that, they know that. And we wanted to stress also that just because a business decides not to sign on to that commitment does not mean they are not a welcoming <laughs> business. It's just mm -hmm. for whatever reason they're deciding not to. And so that is going to be a part of this as well. We're setting up a web page. So all of this will be on the web page as well. And what we're asking for is uh, the city uh, support endorsement uh, behind it. And just to let you know, it will not cost you any money. So, which is always a good thing. Uh, any, thing. <laughs> yeah, that, I figured that might be a yep. question. Yep. Uh, any funds that uh, will be the city's contribution will come through the Human Rights Commission and out of our budget, and it won't be that much. And so there'll be, you know, printing costs, helping with the logo, things like that, that we'll do a share of, but that will come out of the Human Rights Commission budget. So it won't increase our budget because we have money set aside for those types of things already. Will some of your co-sponsors also um, pitch in money for those things? Yes. Yeah, and the Leta the, Human Rights Task Force will be doing that. Others will be doing it as well. And we're hoping to um, launch it officially uh, in September. On, I get my dates mixed up at our inclusive community dinner that we're having in the 1912 Center to do inclusive community month that the Human Rights Commission uh, does every year. And so it's on the 8th, uh, September 8th. The Thursday, we'll be having a potluck dinner at the 1912, but also there will be other food there because uh, La Casa Lopez and several other businesses has already said that they will be donating food for the potluck to help launch the campaign. And, and several business leaders sit, business owners are part of our uh, planning committee as well already. So they're helping us plan it. Do you have any questions? I've got a couple. Uh, so <clears throat> I am a worst case scenario thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my comfort zone. And so I am wondering what our, I know we're saying that the, in the absence of a sticker in a window does not necessarily mean mm -hmm. that someone, uh, a business owner doesn't, maybe just doesn't fit the color scheme, right? Whatever, whatever mm -hmm. the sticker ends up looking like. Um, I'm, I'm still really nervous about this because it seems like anymore anything that is meant to be a really clear black and white statement and an easy an easy thing for us all to agree on does not always land that way. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, 
are you willing to indulge me when I ask what's the worst case scenario? What like what's what's the worst thing that could happen if we launch this? Okay. Um, I mean, one worst case scenario is that a business signs on and uh, signs on to the commitment, and then we find out that they're not following the mm-hmm. commitment and that they're discriminating against people and all that. We are not an enforcement arm or investigative arm or anything. We would approach them just to mediate and say, hey, you know, we hear that this is going on. Can this be alleviated? You know, is it a matter of just not realizing it? Is it employee training? What Mm -hmm. the deal? If they still continue with that behavior, we just ask them to remove the sticker uh, from their business. And if they are doing other things, we're going to encourage people to report to the bias reporting system. Um, if it violates the city ordinances uh, for non-discrimination, then that is a police matter, and it goes to mm-hmm. the police chief because it you know, moves to be a misdemeanor mm-hmm. and once it's investigated and mediated as well. Um, and so we turn it over to them at that point. But we, all we do is ask, would you please remove it uh, because you're not doing it. But that's only worst case. We absolutely have to because we don't want to do that. We want to alleviate it, figure out what the issue is, try to solve the problem. Now, some and to cover another part of that, some businesses may not decide to sign on, and we're going to make that very clear on our website and in every bit of advertisement of this, that that does not mean that they're not welcoming and inclusive. But the thing about it is, is that groups of people that are vulnerable groups in town and students as well, if they are mistreated at a business or discriminated at a business, they already know that. The word of mouth goes through them like wildfire, Mm -hmm. and they will not go into that business. And sometimes that is a mistake. Uh, Sometimes it was just a misunderstanding. Sometimes it may be in one employee that did it. And, you know, things have changed, whatever the case may be, but that rumor still hangs around. And we're hoping this also helps us dispel those kind of things that, you know, you people have said this about it, but that business is not that way normally. And so hopefully that will cover that because these kind of things already happen right. that people, individuals spread the word and avoid businesses and and sometimes that's inaccurate mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we want to alleviate that and give people a chance to yeah to you know be more welcoming and i guess the what i'm gravitating towards is i think we ask a lot of our businesses already and um and i'm wondering if there's more power I, and it's partly because there's just a conversation i had wearing my other hat at work on the moscow chamber board where we were talking about um like codes of conduct. And so we're working on this great code of conduct that I'm really comfortable with. And Tony Mangini kind of turned to me and said, yeah, you must do the same thing for city council. And I was like, no, but there's a mechanism to get rid of me, right? Like there's a recall mechanism if I do something <laughs> stupid. Um, and so, but I'm wondering, but to his point, right? Like a lot of us operate under the assumption that we are, we are representing the city and what that means is rep- mm-hmm. representing inclusivity and, and embracing diversity. And so I'm, I'm wondering if actually the, cause I don't want to, I don't want to I think what you've done has been a, a really big undertaking. Um, but I'm wondering if the focus should be less on business inclusion and more about, you know, a personal vow. And because part of me, the other thing that I think about with worst case scenario is we don't have, Jen is our marketing team, right? Like amongst, amongst what, what, what Megan and, and Amanda and everyone else takes on, right? Like that falls under your umbrella as far as community engagement. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm nervous about the rollout of this. Um, and so I, I'm happy. I, I've monopolized the question time so far. My right. my initial gut is I'd like for this to be on the regular agenda mm-hmm. oh, yeah. to get there, but mm-hmm. um, I, I don't want it to go poorly. And so I, because my comfort zone is the worst case scenario, I like to think through all of those scenarios first and make sure that we as a team have, have an understanding and expectation. Um, so those are those are those were my questions on my list. It's okay that you monopolized. Um, I think I I have the same questions, and I and I really would like to see something in your documentation about how to make this or prevent this from coming becoming just another list of businesses that are approved or not approved. And mm-hmm. I we all know the one I'm talking about, right? And I don't want um, mm-hmm. this to just be another list. Right. And that, and we do not either. And that's why on the website and other things that we're working on that wording to make sure that it it is not just a list. The the idea is to provide residents, uh, 
visitors, students with safe areas that are committed to being safe. Now, that doesn't mean all the others are not safe, and we're going to stress that and push for that. And as an individual thing, we are going to be promoting that as well. The thing with the individual thing, uh, that's the next step to kind of promote that mm -hmm. support because we have found out and doing these kinds of things in other places, when individuals sign on to this and make a commitment, they are not necessarily making that commitment. They're just telling you that and they do whatever they want uh, and under that umbrella. And of course, we have no real mechanism to deal with it. Now, in this one, the only mechanism we have is say, please take down the decal. <laughs> but, you know, and but that at least it's something. But an individual, we don't have that any kind of oversight on as part of it all. Okay, the concern um, that jumped down on the page for me is with the goal of promoting unification and safe zones, mm -hmm. does it actually in some respects further polarize us? And I just have to say we need to think about how that, how we can overcome that. And I just, I mean, mm -hmm. I think the idea is great I just need to sit there and say, okay, I think it's, it was the underlying question of everybody's, how do we make sure that it doesn't polarize our community more than it already is? And that that is something we're very aware of and has been a major topic in all of our meetings. Yes. Um, that we do not want it to polarize. We want it to bring people together. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's we don't want a list of here's the good, here's the bad, uh, that kind of thing. That's not right. what it's going to be. We're... And we're not going to be talking about the negative. We're promoting positive. the positive no, right. about it that, you know, we want to be welcoming. We want to be safe. We're not going to be penalizing or targeting people who we see as not doing that in that sense. I mean, we have to be able to take down the mm -hmm. sticker if they're not following the commitment sure. that they agreed to. But otherwise, you know, we're not targeting them in any way as part of that. And I don't know if um, Joanne or Stephen, if you don't mind, because they can maybe add a little bit more to that too, because they were both on the committee. You, you got you got to come up, Joanne. Come up you know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you guys you give her a chair? A it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back in the practice. Here you go. Come on. Hold on. I got you. No, you don't. <laughs> Good, Stephen. Good, Good job. Okay. I, I, uh, we have hashed and rehashed the things you're talking about. But we're saying, wouldn't it be terrible if you're so afraid of polarizing that you don't move in a positive way? This is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid, oh, I might offend somebody, and then, so you don't do a, a, a great activity project like this, it, I think it, uh, it's bad for the city. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're talking about. And in addition to having the uh, commitment statement and the decals, we're also going to have some educational programs that's open to the whole community to talk about why welcoming is good for business and why it's good for growth in the community. Because I think uh, Moscow has always been known as a welcoming community. We're just reinforcing it. Thanks, Joanne. I appreciate that. Yeah. And Stephen, come on up, sir. <laughs> Dr. Daly Larson, I should probably keep use it, your. I'll, keep it, Steve's fine. Okay, thank <laughs> you. I'll keep it very simple. If you look at the mission statement, we one of the words that we toiled over is the action word, which you see has ended up being cultivate. So there were 15 words on the paper at one point, even a week ago, like promote and act and participate and you know change the world. Yeah. But this word is chosen carefully, par partially because it's an ag metaphor uh, <laughs> by mistake, but it's also because um, it communicates that we're just trying to grow an attitude. And, you know, anyone who disagrees with that, that's fine. That's probably not someone we're going to engage with. We're engaging with folks that are curious about the project, what it means providing education and interaction with people so that we grow what's Moscow's greatest asset, uh, its people, its resource, and their goodness. So I just want to... Um, actually, I have to just say, for me, when you look at the commitment statement, it doesn't define anything, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it uses words like valued, safe, and welcome. And it's hard for someone to say, I don't want to be 
valued, safe. I don't want people in this community to not feel valued, safe, and welcome. And it doesn't delineate what that means. And you have to believe this in order to do it. But it means that we want everybody to be able to walk around the streets, whoever you are, whatever persuasion you are, whatever you you can feel safe and comfortable, valued, safe, and welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Maureen. And notice we didn't say, and to make everyone valued, safe, and respected, <laughs> we said to help people feel that right. way. Uh-huh. Those are carefully chosen words. Well, Thanks for that You did question. well on that. Thank you for You're crafting welcome, it well. Okay. So it's clear who the marketing guy is, right? <laughs> um, I, I have to say that I think I think you have definitely, and I know Joanne well enough to know that there's been lots and lots of hours put into this. Mm-hmm. So I think that this is a good platform and a good beginning. It may not be the end product yet, but maybe that's the iterative nature of cultivation in general. So um, I do think this is definitely regular agenda on uh, Monday night. Sorry, you got to come to the meeting. Um, but I I think... Um, It'll be a fun one. I actually think it's a good thing to have Joanna and Steve come back to it as well. And so... Yeah, they, they will be at the city council meeting, yes. Right. Okay. Or at least Stephen will. I think John's out of town. Mm-hmm. And actually, I'm out of town as well, but I'll have a representative from the commission there. So, <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is coming to visit, but I'll be here. <laughs> I on the agenda. That's all. Well, um, <laughs> we appreciate your your time today, and we will definitely forward it to regular agenda on Monday. Okay. And we already just put a word in that we'll try and get that early on the agenda versus yeah. late. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we appreciate putting us on the front of the agenda. So. Sure. <laughs> That's some power right there, Joanne. You need to know that. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thanks, Ken. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. I believe it. I yeah. believe that, too. Oh, because everybody knew what the questions were, kind of, and so it's like how to create it and craft it. And I think you've done an excellent job on that. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is the Elk River Disposal Contract Proposal. Mr. Davis. This is a couple of these meetings in a row now. Are you becoming dependent on these meetings? Do you like them? Yes. Okay. That's great. So um, <clears throat> the city. You're welcome. You must feel really welcome then. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Moscow has been approached by the city of Elk River regarding acceptance and disposal of their waste stream at the Moscow Solid Waste Processing Facility. Elk River is an outlying community located in North Clearwater County and as such was dependent on Clearwater County Solid Waste Department located in Orofino for their service. Clearwater County waste is hauled to a Soton County landfill in Clarkston, Washington as Clearwater County has a disposal contract with the Soton County. Due to a number of circumstances, including Elk River's dissatisfaction with the services that they were receiving, uh, Clearwater County's failing roll-off truck, and Elk River's proximity to the Moscow Solid Waste Processing Facility, staff has been approached regarding the Moscow disposal option. Inland North Waste had been accepting Elk River waste at the Moscow Solid Waste Processing Facility prior to realizing that Moscow did not have a disposal agreement in place with Elk River. In your packet, you will find the proposed disposal agreement, which will formalize this relationship if approved. Elk River produces approximately 200 tons of waste annually. Um, Staff does not see a significant impact to the operations at the Solid Waste Processing Facility by accepting Elk River's waste stream. The one impact that will likely be affected by the acceptance of Elk River waste is the annual tonnage provision and the franchise agreement between the City of Moscow and Latos Sanitation. If the actual annual tonnage received at the solid waste processing facility exceeds the base tonnage of 32,200 tons in a contract year, this triggers additional compensation to Latos Sanitation, which currently is $15.62 per ton. We have met that threshold the past several years, and it's looking like we will meet that threshold again. So it's likely that um, that will be triggered. Even without Elk River? Without Elk River's waste. But the answer is, can I just, so it means to me that at this point, you know that it's going to, and we're just going to charge Elk River accordingly so that we don't lose money on it, right? Precisely. Thank you. The rates proposed to accept 
to accept Elk River's waste, um, you will see in your packet listed as Exhibit A. For the remaining time left in fiscal year 22, the rates were developed taking our current tipping fees, which are 95.85 per ton for municipal solid waste and 39.10 per ton for non-municipal waste, then adding that annual tonnage rate of 15.62 to both. Um, that would total to 111.47 per ton for municipal solid waste and 54.72 per ton for non-municipal waste. Then the same method, <clears throat> same method was used to develop rates for the um, upcoming FY23 budget year beginning October 1 of 22. Those rates would be 114.24 per ton for MSW and 56.34 for non-MSW. Questions? You said 200 tons in Elk River. What is what do we produce? <laughs> um, on an annual basis, um, I think we've been shipping about 21,000 tons of MSW alone. And I believe there's another eight or nine tons of non-municipal, if memory serves. So it's a drop in the bucket to the total? Pretty much. Cool. Okay. Pretty much. Right on. Do you have any questions? No. I think this is good. Mm -hmm. I think this is, um, Elk River's been slowly, I think they'll join Latah County here before too long. They're just, they're just realizing how good it is on this side of the border. <laughs> so I, I think this is a, this is a good thing. Um, and to me, I guess I, my thought is, is that if it, if we can help them out mm -hmm. and we can do it in a way that's not costing the city money out of our pocket, we can be a good neighbor. I'm all in favor of it. Yep. Okay. Consent or regular? Um, Tell us if we have to, which is there, do we have to do it? Consent. Consent. Uh, That's fine. <laughs> I'd like to say consent unless somebody tells me we can't. You, we, we can, we can, where's consent. my consent gavel? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want a gavel. Um, I think it's fine. I always pull consent. it off. But consent yeah, may somebody be a good can place pull it start. off if they if they want it. Okay, sir, okay. we're going to go on consent. I've never had anything on consent in my thirteen and a half years. <laughs> You're lying. Are you complaining? You're lying. No, present. I'm not. <laughs> All right, well, have this day and be happy. I yeah. am. Do not start have to on the calendar. We'll bring a cake in next year for Absolutely. celebrating. Okay, so look at this guy just dropping in. Mm -hmm. All here. right, our next item is Tim Davis. The Tim Davis Show, uh, the Roll-Off Container Program Adjustments Proposal. Tim, tell us what you got going on. Um, the Roll-Off Container Services are an elective service that provides a customer an avenue to dispose of larger, bulkier items, as well as demolition-type materials that cannot typically be serviced with uh, city route trucks. Roll-off containers are typically used um, during construction or demolition projects, such as re-roofing or just larger cleanup projects. In your packet, you have a proposal from Inland North Waste. Um, I would like to just touch on a few of the points and how they differ from the current program. Inland North Waste will be offering four additional size options of roll-off containers, including eight, 11, 15, and 45-yard containers in addition to the 22 yard and 30 cubic yard containers currently in use. These smaller size options extend the customer some flexibility, especially in areas where neighborhoods that would not normally be able to accommodate the traditional larger 22 and 30 yard containers, which are both eight feet wide and 22 feet long. The 45 yard containers could also be used down at Moscow Recycling to replace the 30 yard containers currently being used to transport brush and yard waste. This will result in less trips from Moscow Recycling out to the compost facility. Inland North Waste is also proposing to take on the direct customer billing of roll off container services. The city currently conducts monthly billing for these services, which can be confusing to the customers and a duplication of efforts. Inland North Waste initiates the process at the customer's request, conducts all service management and record keeping throughout the process, and provides calculation of charges for these services to the city. By taking on the direct billing, um, it would eliminate the city, you know, reproducing efforts there. And Inland North Waste would also take on any liabilities of non-payment. Um, the city will still retain the proceeds from all tonnage fees associated with roll-off container services and Inland North Waste will provide all hauling, rentals, sorting, 
damage deposit, and pull delay fees. So in other words, um, all tonnage that goes across the scales, the city still gets credit for that. And, and it really is a duplication of efforts and, and staff feels that this would be a good good move. So yeah, with this with this being an elective service, not not one of the life-sustaining services that our standard garbage service is, when Inland North Waste brought this to us, it seemed to make a lot of sense to simplify that process um, and have them take that on. And then the addition of the additional sizes we think will be a better service to those customers who do elect to engage with the service. Um, this is a, um, this proposal will require an agreement update. And so our legal department is working on that update. Uh, the reason I bring that up is I'm, we're not hundred percent sure that this will come to council in the next session. So it might be, uh, another session before we get through the legal update. Um, but we'll let council know as that proceeds. So I just have a couple of real quick questions in terms of the duplication. Is there a charge for us? Will they, will go Will we increase the charge that we have to, that they charge us now if they are doing the billing? They will bill at the same rate for the service itself. There are a few different changes in rental rates um, that will be adjusted. They'll be simply daily rates instead of right now we have the, the first rental rate counts the first five business days. And then after that, it's that same amount each day. So this will just be a straight rental rate. Um, they will be charging a deposit. And that's simply because of the use of these type of boxes on construction sites and, you know, damage that could, you know, from a, a track hoe or what have you. Just, They're expensive pieces of equipment. And, um, right. I was more concerned about them doing the billing and doing all the billing yeah, processes. It cost us and, and is it going to cost, is it going to cost the, either the um, residents or the city more money to have them do it? I don't think so. I there, don't see why. There, there was a fee that went to the city for administrator for administering that that that, that will now go to Inland North Waste for those activities. Um, the the adjustments that are contained in the packet there largely just bring it into alignment with industry standards anymore. The expectation is you're going to have to put a deposit on a really expensive box that goes out there, and then the adjustment of the fees really helps encourage people to mm -hmm. get it and keep it for the period of time that they're right. actually using right, it right. but not have it sit out and there are some benefits both to the city and to inland north waste through that process because because of inland clutter because of clutter in the right of way because yeah. of some of the issues that you can have with parking etc we don't want these out for longer than they need to be out so there's a dual benefit there so most of the adjustments just bring that into alignment with modern industry standards and then we there there are some of those incentives to actually engage with the program sure. the way it's intended to be used so the the um, additional types of containers that we're going to have, I mean, who bears those costs? In, Inland North Waste does all the procurement of those, and they have that built into their rates that they charge for the depreciation of those over time. And Smart. so that's it's just a way for us to not be engaged with a program that we don't need to be engaged with that it eliminates confusion for the customer. And then Inland North Waste can, can run that and run that program efficiently. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was going to – my only other thing to add is I'm having helped – at Ren Fair for many years, I'm excited to not have you guys have to haul an enormous, ginormous container if there's if there's things that we can right size. And I also think that we have the opportunity to get get some additional events on on board with the idea of what we do with Ren Fair and um, and Rendezvous, and also not having it block half of the parking lot at East City Park right. for five days because that's that's just what the clock's running on. I think it'll be. I I like more choices in this case because I do think it'll help um, our community and INW and the city run a more efficient program. So I'm on board. Great. Consent agenda. We'll have the actual agreement. So we'll bring either the agreement back to committee or to council on regular agenda mm -hmm. so you okay. can see the full yeah. document. Yep. So I do right. think you haven't seen worth, that yet. It's worth a discussion. With I am generally recommending too. the approval of, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of the thing. Sometimes doesn't it come on the thing that says uh, – that we agreed and that it's going, but we it's still can, going. We you can, can, you can still yeah. recommend, even if it's on regular, the committee can mm -hmm. make a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Do we want to do that? Um, I, I'd like to see all six of us discuss it. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll bring it back to you. So. And also it comes with the, the agreement, the agreement that right. we do. Yep. Yeah. 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 Might as well just do it that way. Yeah. One time. All right. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is Mountain View Road, 6th Street Roundabout Landscaping. I love the change of topic here. So Mr. Von Traeger. Buckle up. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. So this is in relation to the project that we currently have going on out there for Mountain View, which is uh, 6th to Joseph right now, the roundabout at 6th and Mountain View. We originally didn't have it in part of the federally funded project to do landscaping within the roundabout. So this had come up. We was had it a, Was it a federal requirement to not include it or did we just want to make sure we got the federal money? Well, and... over over the time as we were designing the other project, we had to keep having cost cutting cost oh. cutting portions of it and landscaping was one of them, yeah. including other things. Always, so it's always wanted to go first. So this one we had designed by JUB's landscape architects this last year. We went through a few different iterations, the type of plantings and the, you know, what we wanted in the roundabout were including uh, conduit and other types of devices in there to have electricity and water available for other future public art or anything else that we want in there. But this particular one is uh, a contract to do... The plantings, the landscaping, the irrigation, we're going to put in five trees, 25 shrubs, a whole bunch of different uh, decorative grasses, boulders, rock mulch, so it'll make it look a lot nicer out there. Uh, the existing contractor out there um, showed interest in doing the project. They already have all the equipment, so they have a certain efficiency. We uh, gave it to them to give us a bid since this is under, we estimated, the engineer's estimate was under 50000 so state statute says you can basically just go out to anybody for this. We'd asked for a price from them. They came back with uh, 49925 Oh, and since it's under, we don't have to go to RFP for it? Okay, yeah. gotcha. So that's great. So it's within the budget that we had programmed for this. Yeah. We're just providing, uh, you know, staff's recommending awarding the, the contract to Western Construction while they're out there to do the work for the 49925 I have one question, because um, I took, is it Celtis in or Appleway and Coeur d'Alene mm -hmm. post falls. And they got some big old trees that do not make it fun to be driving three roundabouts in a row. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess my question is how do our engineers, like I, my hope is they're going to be planting something tall and skinny. Mm -hmm. I just, I, we already have people who hate roundabouts in this town. Um, and we already have people who are, hate that there's going to be a roundabout there. And I don't really want to give them another reason to hate it. So um, can we, are, is it something to want to rent ring? Like, like I would love to see something that doesn't impede. put us in a, yeah, impede the view and put in, put us in a bad position. Yeah, the type of trees that are being used on this are the smaller, more, well, they're the dwarf pine trees, the the more decorative ones that grow probably like six to eight feet tall. I'm Googling a dwarf pine tree right now. I, I have the exact. Oh, cute little buddies. Okay, great. Yeah. Look at those. Look at those <laughs> Okay, Just, I'm less nervous now. All she yeah, wants and, to do is make sure that it, it the comes roundabout away itself. I mean, it's typical for roundabouts that you typically mount it up about three, four feet because the intent of a roundabout is to not see through it. So you do have to your, slow your down. focus right. is to look into the left and going right. Agreed. I just. Um, yeah. Facebook comments these days are a lot of people who are grumpy about a roundabout going in. So, I'm excited. There is a full list of all the plantings, but it's oh, is way it in the down in the your contract? packet. Okay. Um, yeah. So the formal form, bristle cone is tied pages. at a four foot height. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's our tallest. Oh, one. oh, oh it, I see it. It's, okay. four foot it's really installed. hard to see from the picture, but if you get into the other details, it, it'll be it great. And I love that we're planning ahead for irrigation and for public art. So I, yeah. sounds great. No concerns. Maureen, do you want to throw out some landscape knowledge too? <laughs> No, okay. I just want to make sure that awesome. it's it's native, it's native yeah. plants, and we can yep. minimize the amount of uh, water that we use on it, and make it as another example of how we conserve water. And that's part of the requirements we had when we were working with them, and we also worked with parks directly to make sure everything was maintainable, and that it wasn't a whole bunch of stuff that had to be mowed or highly watered all the time. Are we did? Mm -hmm. Parks is on board. Okay. Parks is okay, on board. That's the one that I have yep. the endorsement there. <laughs> Roundabouts. Gina, I love them. I, hey, I recommend acceptance. Okay. I think all three of us are on that same page. And I think we can do that by consent. My last question, if the, if they end up going beyond the the 10% and it bumps us over that 50 for the RF, like, does that trigger anything for us? Are we okay assuming that the contract initially started below? Okay. Yeah. Great. At the time of award. At the time Correct. of award. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Not that much below. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank Gives you. Us I the apologize $75. for the um, circus-like nature of this meeting today. I missed you guys. What's okay. Nice? Our, our next item is the Paradise Path Lighting Project Conduit Installation Bid Results. Mr. Sir. You know, it will be just one moment. I'm realizing now I have to log in. So. Okay, sir, sir. <laughs> 
<laughs> sorry, Gina. Sorry, sorry. Okay. The thing that was up on the screen the entire rest of the presentation decided it was going to go to sleep right before I needed it. So. <laughs> Maybe we should make the landscaping part part of the regular agenda so we could have like a presentation <laughs> with trees and stuff in it. You know what? Actually, I go back on my thing. I think I'd take it off consent just so people can see it. I know. Too late. It, it is too late, <laughs> but that would be. But my two cents, I'm getting, there's enough casual, I, I fair, but there's an, I don't know if we can have like a general um, <clears throat> two second update at the general meeting with like. We'd also be happy to do some social media outreach that that may reach a few more people. I just am meeting. getting questions it's about the timeline really between the, the D street intersection, the roundabout and, and Joseph happy to use okay. Okay. channels. Okay. Let's get back onto our, our agenda. Um, I threw that out there as a funny, not as a suggestion. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say this again. Our next item is the paradise path lighting project conduit installation bid results. Nate, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'm Nate, sir, with the engineering division of the community development department. So we're talking about, bid results for our Paradise Pathway Lighting Phase 1. Um, the last time we brought this project up was for a bid rejection for the full project, so I have a little bit better news today. Um, a little bit of an update. So this is just kind of showing roughly where the project corridor is. We have the existing White Avenue and Troy Highway underpass, the proposed US 95 underpass, and we'd be working in this corridor connecting the two of them. So it's kind of a shaded area by the creek, mm -hmm. not a lot of natural lighting. So it tends to get dark in the winter and the evenings, obviously. Um, talking about the project, the previous bid, um, we expected about $180,000 price tag and saw about twice that when we opened these bids back in April of 21. Um, so anytime that happens, we start looking for individual items that uh, raise some concern. And you can see highlighted here, one of the things that really got away from us was the installation of the conduit. We were expecting about a $50,000 price tag and we saw triple that. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, we started asking questions and digging into that a little bit more. And the two things that kept coming up were a lack of availability of conduit and uh, a lack of specialty contractors. So having someone that uses a specialized piece of equipment to install this conduit without having to trench backfill, do some of the other things that a, an excavator might have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to kind of further that goal, what we ended up having to do is just, I mean, there was nothing we could do for the availability. That was just a matter of waiting until uh, the supply chain mm -hmm. uh, kind of corrected itself. But uh, we actually broke out only the conduit portion of the project. And in order to attract people that do specifically conduit work, but may not do some of the other things that we're asking, was closer to what we actually wow. experienced. So we had an engineer's estimate of 49,970 and for $20.50 over that, wow. we can get a, a conduit project. <laughs> so we're very happy to see that. And based on that, we would recommend acceptance of the bid. So if there are any wow. questions. Questions for them? <laughs> I, I, the idea of compartmentalizing our bids has really been helpful to us. Um, this is kind of the third or fourth meeting where that's kind of happened. And I just want to affirm um, the fact that we're getting contracts through because of that decision to compartmentalize them. So thank you. Thank you. And I also bet that makes it more appealing to contractors who want to fill, you know, a short, short window between big gigs or whatever. So, um, and so this would just leave us ready for the next step for if and when we procure the actual lighting. And we've actually, the the bid for the lighting installation, so that would be the bases, the connections, the bollards, and the overhead lights, um, went out this Friday. So hope Excellent. all Good. things going well. Good. We'll see you shortly. Eating that elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Well, I say this one's consent. Yep. Okay. No argument. But No argument. <laughs> Just kidding. The peanut gallery is right. a little unruly today. Thanks, Nate. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate you. Okay, our, oh, not our last one yet. Our next agenda item is the Palouse Groundwater Basin Water Alternative Supply Contract Extension. Tyler, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Happy to be here to discuss this extension on the contract. Um, as the council may recall, the city was asked to administer a contract with Alta Science and Engineering on behalf of PBAC. This is an exciting contract. It's for the continuation of the anchor QEA work that was done back in 2016 to identify feasible alternatives for our water issue, um, alternative supply. Um, and that the, the work that that project did really narrowed down, okay, what's feasible? How do we group these together? And what does that look like it, as we strive to meet a 50-year demand horizon? Um, and this and it identified several data gaps that we need to fill in order to try and select a preferred alternative. And so then the city hired uh, Alta Science and Engineering to continue that work. And this has been the continuation of that process. We are on the council's agenda for September 5th to come with a report on that project. And we anticipate distributing the report to the council two weeks before that meeting for your review. So super exciting time in the history of trying to solve the water issues on the Palouse, which has been a hundred year process. Uh, we really feel like we are making some significant progress toward this. Um, this uh, this contract extension allows for the city to, or excuse me, for PBAC through the city to engage with Alta as we really initiate a robust public involvement process. Um, as many of you are aware, the every feasible project that has been proposed up to this point in the hundred year history of trying to solve this has been absolutely submarine by a lack of appropriate public involvement. And it's something that we're really committed to getting right. Um, we don't want the perception to be that a group of people got behind a closed door and picked right. what was right without engaging with the community. And so this is a really critical process and keeping Alta engaged through that process we think is important. PBAC approved this funding at, the Jul at a July 28th meeting. Um, the funding would come from the PBAC research funds that the city contributes to. Um, and so this, like the previous phases of this contract, uh, the city would invoice PBAC for the full amount, and then they will provide those the funds to the city before we pay out any invoices for that contract. This, this extension will be done on a time and materials basis, and so the new PBAC executive director, Salina Accord, would approve the work that then Alta would engage in on a time and materials basis. And so it is up to, but not to exceed the $50,000, and then any funds that were left over at the end of the period, we would reimburse back to PBAC. I'm happy to answer any questions y'all might have on this. My only statement is I'm glad to see that the community outreach is going to be a big part of it because I think this is going to be a huge um, project, a huge expensive project, and to get buy-in from everyone. Um, it's fun to see the city both on C Streetscape and on this one to really reach out to the public. So thank you. Haley? That was going to be my question was how how does the consultant formula fit in with the new shift to the executive director? And um, so it sounds like, yeah, she's got agency. She's got, I mean, it's a nice balancing act between always with the board and the stakeholders and and the, and the director. And so I'm on board because you cleared that up. So no concerns. Okay. Consent. Um, yep. I think consent is a good idea. And okay. We're looking forward to that report. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Thank September you. 5, Thank we think. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Tyler. Well, before that, actually. Oh, yeah. See it before then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our last item on this uh, roller coaster ride of a meeting is the amendment to Moscow City Code Title 11, Chapter 2, Bicycles, E-Bikes, E-Scooters, and E-Boards, and repeal of Title 11, Chapter 3, Bicycles. <laughs> Cody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we are proposing two changes to Title 11 and Mo uh, to Moscow City Code today. Uh, the first, as you noted, was to repeal uh, Chapter 3, the bicycle chapter. Uh, that was established years ago with the intent uh, largely to aid in the recovery of stolen bicycles. Um, as noted in your packet, I think it was over five years there between 2016 and 2021, almost 400 that were impounded, only seven of those devices or seven of those bikes um, were licensed, so it's it's largely proven ineffective. Uh, but the police, in in speaking with the police department who enforce this, they do want to maintain a voluntary program for those that do do wish to uh, register their bikes. Um, I'm the prouder of proud owner of two mountain bikes that were licensed with the city of Moscow in my previous stint here back in the late nineties. <laughs> so if they're ever stolen, I'll have a way to uh, <laughs> to recover Reunite. them. Excellent. Um, so I wonder whether or not. Um, that is, in fact, causing we need the term like letting people know how to, what the process is to get their bikes. And is there a material at the bike stores so that, you know, maybe people didn't get it, didn't get them licensed because they didn't know they could. I'm not saying we should not do that, but I still think that it's probably a good idea. And um, 
I think it is a good idea to use that. And I don't think it has to be part of the code, but I do believe that we could think about, do we have materials? Yeah, we, could cert we can certainly look at outreach around the voluntary program. I, I think when I bought my bike right before COVID hit, it was my, I had to go to city hall to get my, nope, not city hall, police station, old police station to get the form. Um, and it's like $7 and I think it is an awareness so thing. Time. And I want to say when I bought from Paradise Creek, they had recommended, but it was like a very loose recommendation. The other thing I'll say is like, I, I think you're, that's fair, Maureen, because I also think people don't realize that you're supposed to get register your dog with the city, um, yeah. which I also found out in that same visit to the police station. So, uh, <laughs> at least they let you out of there. That's true. Yeah, could could have been worse, you guys. Uh, and so it'd be re so we're at, talking about repealing the definition of bicycle. Got it. Yeah, just repealing that just entire the chapter. Yeah, because right. there are still right. the the second component of this amendment is to amend chapter uh, chapter two and the, specifically the definition around abandonment. Um, after talking to police further again around enforcement, yeah. uh, we did want to clarify just what constitutes abandoned and make it clear that in certain instances, if, if uh, you know, devices are left in a way that it creates a public safety concern that the, the whole tagging uh, provision doesn't apply and they can remove them just immediately. I did yeah. notice in your packet somewhere lost in translation, the 48-hour... Uh, reference to 48 hours, that is a change. It's currently 72 hours. So when we bring the final proposal huh. to council, mm -hmm. we should, we'll make it clear in that red line strikeout version Good. that it's going from 72 to 48. And that's actually consistent with uh, state code around actual automobile um, impoundment. So, Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I think that... Uh, Sorry, Jen. Just one other fun point is with the repeal of the required bicycle licensing, that was something through the National Walk Bike Alliance, Bike Walk mm -hmm. Alliance. I'm looking. American cyclists. There we go. We did a, a had us had our system reviewed to get a silver, gold, bronze um, rating. And that was one of the recommendations is remove that bicycle license requirement oh. to make it easier for bicyclists to have equipment and have reduce vehicle. that barrier. So oh, cool. we can, I think we'll move up to a gold level in that. Uh, category now. So that's fun too. Whoa. So yeah. does that remove the cost then as well to, I think the mm -hmm. the cost would goes if away it's voluntary pro it's voluntary program. If you're still licensing them, I think the cost would still, would still mm -hmm. apply. Yeah. but you wouldn't be it's, required. It, to you license, wouldn't be required. So. Okay. And it's $7, so we only $7 one and of it's, the a lifetime, mm -hmm. it's a lifetime, it's a lifetime permit or license. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. an annual requirement. Is this an okay form for me to ask for you to share the update that you shared with me about the e-scooter news? Oh, certainly. About the latest I'm, timeline I'm for deployment? That. Why not? I, <laughs> only because I was, I remember during our conversation on council, we were, I was really feeling more comfortable with the idea of the e-scooters knowing that they were trying to be deployed during the summer so we could work through the kinks and it. Sounds like it's been a support. Well, it's, among other things, the, the students are are just about back. Yes, um, I think they had you know a couple of things that were a challenge for the for the scooter company. Um, first of all, just supply supply right. chain like everyone, and then staffing. They had it was it took a little bit longer to hire their to local agent. It. They have that local person in place, and now it's getting the, the scooters ready to ship. Um, cool. So right now it looks like a couple of weeks out probably. September, and, we'll, and they've provided they've provided quite a few. Um, Oh, quite a bit of literature and things mm -hmm. that will help us do we'll outreach. Do so when we have a date, a, a pretty firm date, we'll do um, awesome. quite a bit of outreach around that. Since the topic got raised, are they still going to phase it in with, instead of not having 200 bikes at one time, we're going to phase it in? I think that their plan they had indicated in a conversation a week or two ago was about 20 or 30 to start. And then about once a week, they add a few more and they, they track them and see where they're, you know, where, where, where rides originate, where they, where they end and kind of slowly adjust. Cool. Excellent. Jen, do we have any staff reports? No staff reports. And I'm going to say the city code goes to, re or city code amendment will send to regular agenda. Yeah. Just to clarify. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think but that no, would be no good. staff reports at this time. Okay. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Shall we adjourn? Amen. Okay. Amen. <laughs>